later on this afternoon. Now, we'll move on to the next item of business, and that's a debate on motion 11659 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Scotland Bill, and it's stage one. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion for up to 13 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, I'm struck by the progress that we have made as a society in advancing the rights of LGBTI people in Scotland in what is actually a very short period of time. There's no doubt such progress needed to be made, and I'm pleased that the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Scotland Bill is a further sign of the progress being made. It might seem astounding to younger people today that it was within the lifetime of this Parliament in 2001 that the age of consent for same-sex sexual activity between men was equalised with that for different sex partners at 16. Or that it was only in 1980, well within the memory of many of us within this chamber, that same-sex sexual activity was decriminalised. And even then, only were both parties we're over 21. These legal changes have been accompanied by considerable shifts in social attitudes over the same period. In 2000, nearly half, some 48% of respondents to the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey said that they thought same-sex relationships were always or mostly wrong. When the same question was asked in 2015, that had fallen to under a third, some 18%. That's a reminder both of how far we have come and of the fact that there is still a way to go. Until we live in a country where no one suffers discrimination, prejudice or fear because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, then we have still got work to do. However, we should not overlook the fact that there are people who are continuing to suffer as a result of the discriminatory laws that, sadly, parliamentarians in Scotland over many decades supported, or at least accepted, without taking steps to get rid of them. Well, there is nothing that this parliament can do to reverse the injustices experienced by those who live for years with the fear of criminal prosecution simply for showing love and affection to their partner, the Historical Sexual Offences Pardon and Disregards Bill is intended to deal with the ongoing real-life impact on people's lives that those discriminatory laws can continue to have. Then, officer, the bill is concerned with historical sexual offences, which criminalised same-sex sexual activity between men. There are two distinct kinds of offences that this covers. Those which were in and of themselves discriminatory, such as the offence at Section 7 of the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 1976, that specifically criminalised sexual activity between men. And those which were more general in nature, but, but, but which were capable of being used in a manner that discriminated against men who engaged in same-sex sexual activity, like the common law offence of shameless indecency and breach of the peace. The bill makes provision in two separate but connected areas. It provides a pardon to people who were convicted of historical sexual offences that criminalised sexual activity between men for activity that is now legal. And it puts in place a scheme to enable a person who has been convicted of a historical sexual offence to apply to have that conviction disregarded, so that it will never be disclosed as, for example, as part of an enhanced disclosure check. 
The Bill provides that a person who has been convicted of a historical sexual offence is pardoned for that offence if the conduct for which they were convicted would not be an offence if it occurred in the same circumstances on the day in which the Bill comes into force. So, for example, if a person had been convicted of an offence under the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 1980 for engaging in consensual same-sex sexual activity with an 18-year-old man at a time before the age of consent was reduced from 21 to 18 in 1995 or equalised at 16 in 2001, he would be pardoned. If, on the other hand, a person were convicted of the same offence for engaging in sexual activity with a 14-year-old child, he would not be pardoned because such conduct remains criminal. Then, also, the pardon is automatic and is symbolic. It does not reverse the conviction, but does lift the burden associated with the conviction and is formal recognition that the person should never have been punished. So, an officer, I want to say a little about why, while the pardon is important, it does not tell the whole story. When the First Minister made her statement to Parliament on the 7th of November last year, at the time the bill was introduced, apologising to those whose lives were affected by these unjust and discriminatory laws, she said that while a pardon is the correct legal response to apply to these convictions, the term pardon could be interpreted so as to imply that Parliament sees the men affected by this as being pardoned for something they have done wrong. However, we should be absolutely clear this is not the case here. For people convicted of offences for engaging in same-sex sexual activity that is now legal, the wrong has been committed by the state and not by those individuals. That is why the government and parliament made a statement of unqualified apology. And this apology is an essential part of the overall scheme to help acknowledge the wrongfulness of these convictions. Namely, an apology, a pardon, and of course, a disregard. It's important that we recognize that those who were convicted for engaging in same-sex sexual activity can continue to suffer discrimination as a result of those convictions. It's highly likely that any such conviction would be spent under the terms of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act and would not normally require to be disclosed when a person is applying for a job or a voluntary role. However, there is, of course, I'll give way to Kezia Dugdale. Kezia Dugdale. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. He's often referenced the phrase sexual activity, but would he also acknowledge that what we're talking about sometimes here was men kissing in public, and also even the act of just chatting each other up, and somehow that's been defined over history as sexual activity? Does he understand how abhorrent that's been for communities in the past? General Michael Sir, Matheson. General Sir, I do recognise that. That's the very reason why the term sexual activity in this bill has been broadened out to ensure that it covers that type of activity that people were being criminalised, which is distinctive from the approach that's been taken with the legislation in England and Wales. General Sir, however, there is a risk uh, that such convictions, though they will now be many years old, could continue to be disclosed when a person is applying for a role, for example, working with children or vulnerable adults, for which an enhanced disclosure check is required, as this includes information about any spent convictions. The disregard scheme will enable a person with a conviction for a historical sexual offence, which criminalised same-sex sexual activity between men that would now be legal to apply to have the conviction disregarded. So that, that information about that conviction will not show up on any disclosure check. So while the pardon is symbolic in manner, the disregard scheme 
has a real and beneficial effect. It might be helpful if I set out in general terms how the scheme will operate, presiding officer. The bill sets out the information that a person applying to have a conviction disregarded should what they should provide in their application. If the bill is passed, when the scheme comes into operation, we'll operate a standard application form, associated guidance to assist people to make an application which will develop, will develop in conjunction with key stakeholders such as the Equality Network to make the process as straightforward as possible. Ministers are required to take reasonable steps to obtain and consider any record of the investigation of the conduct which led to the conviction and any subsequent proceedings relating to that conduct. We anticipate that when the Scottish Government receives an application, in the first instance, we would make a request to Police Scotland for information they hold about a person's convictions. In some cases, the information that Police Scotland provide may be sufficient in itself to determine the application. In other cases, it may be necessary to seek any information that other bodies, such as, for example, the Crown Office and the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service, may hold about the particular case. The bill provides... I'll give way to the member. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank the, thank the current secretary for taking uh, intervention. Will he ensure that um, all uh, attention is given to uh, ensuring that the process is as simple, easy and straightforward as possible, as much of the evidence we heard uh, is that we can learn from other systems in the UK that this process really gets it right for people? Michael Matheson. So, no, sir, as I've mentioned, I'm very keen to make sure we simplify this process as best we can, while at the same time ensuring we capture the necessary information in order to give due consideration to any application uh, for a disregard. And the engagement we'll have with a number of stakeholders around the development of the application form will assist us in making sure we try to uh, get that balance right. I want to try and make it as uh, uh, to try and prevent any bureaucracy getting in the way uh, of someone considering making an application. So uh, not only about the application form uh, that they have to complete, but also the guidance that goes alongside that, that it should be as straightforward as possible to allow people uh, who are considering to make an application to be able to complete that process uh, as straightforwardly as possible. So, and also, the bill provides for a presumption in favour of granting a disregard uh, when it's being considered that is to say that ministers will have a duty to grant the disregard and that it is only displaced if it appears to them either that the conviction is not actually for a historical sexual offence at all. Uh, for example, it was actually a conviction for shoplifting or assault or that the conviction was for an act which remains illegal today. For example, because it involved sexual activity with a child under the age of 16, or because it involved non-consensual sexual activity. The bill provides that where a disregard is granted, any relevant record keeper, that is to say, any organisation holding information about a conviction that could be used in any kind of disclosure check, must remove reference to the disregarded conviction and give notice of the removal to the person who has the disregarded conviction. It also provides that where a disregard is granted, the person is to be treated for all purposes as not having committed the offence and not having been charged, prosecuted, convicted or sentenced for the offence. This means that if asked about it, they would be under no legal obligation to disclose such a conviction. And if, for example, a potential employer we are to find by, out by word of mouth that an applicant had such a conviction, it would not be lawful for them to discriminate against the person because they had such a conviction. Sign officer, I'm under no illusion that this bill or any legislation can in itself right the massive injustice caused by these discriminatory laws that criminalised the act of loving another adult, deter people from being open about who they are to family, friends, neighbours and work colleagues and by sending a message that Parliament considered that homosexuality was wrong, encouraged homophobia 
and hatred. However, through the pardon, the Bill sends a clear message to those who were affected by these laws that they were unjust and through the establishment of a disregard scheme, we can ensure that people do not continue to suffer discrimination as a result of such convictions being disclosed to potential employers or to organisations for whom they wish to undertake voluntary work. I move the motion in my name. I call on Christina McKelvey to speak on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for up to eight minutes, please, Ms McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It is indeed a privilege to speak in this debate today as the convener of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. And I would like to start by thanking all of the witnesses who provided both written and oral evidence to the committee to allow us to do our stage one scrutiny of the bill. Our thanks go also to the clerks who as ever support us in our work to the highest of standards and we're very grateful for that. But I'd especially want to thank those individuals who provided evidence about their personal experiences. Above all, I wish to express the committee's gratitude to two witnesses who met with us privately and spoke movingly about the impact of historical convictions on their lives. We were privileged that they saw fit to share their stories with us and it was their stories that helped us come to the recommendations that we have. I'd also like to offer my thanks to those LGBTI organisations who have laid the groundwork over a long time for us to be able to debate this legislation today. Presiding officer, the Scottish Parliament has a proud reputation of working to create a more just, equal and fair society for all of the people of Scotland. And this includes addressing the mistakes of the past and lifting the burden of discrimination for those who have experienced it. Today, we take another step along that journey to building a truly equal Scotland for all. This bill, alongside the apology made by the First Minister in November, recognises that gay and bisexual men in Scotland were unfairly discriminalised by our laws and that the shadow of discrimination cast by those laws still falls across their lives today. However, the pardon granted by this bill not only seeks to put right this wrong, but also confirms to those men, whether still living or now deceased, that they did nothing wrong. They were the victims, not the perpetrators, and it was society's crime not theirs. Presiding officer, the committee began taking oral evidence on this bill on the 1st of February, which appropriately co coincided with the start of LGBT History Month. It was a good start for us as well. Today, it might seem that the laws which discriminated against LGBTI Scots and especially gay men were consigned to the history books some time ago. However, we know this is not true. Indeed, I think it's worth reminding ourselves just how recently such laws still existed. The 19th century American inventor Joseph Francis, who designed the forerunner of the modern lifeboat, once remarked that, as long as society is anti-gay, then it will seem like being gay is antisocial. Such progressive views were rare in the 19th century. And Scotland, as elsewhere, was a society where homophobia was deeply ingrained, and this homophobia was often enshrined in our criminal laws. What marked us out in our attitude was how long consenting same-sex relations between men remained a criminal offence punishable under Scots law. Many of our European neighbours abolished their main criminal statutes on male same-sex relationships long, long before us. For example, France reformed its law in this area in 1791. Belgium followed suit in 1795, the Netherlands in 1811 and Italy in 1890. And most of our Scandinavian neighbours changed their laws in male same-sex relations after World War II. Of course, that doesn't mean that homophobia wasn't widespread in those countries, but consent in same-sex relationships between men wasn't seen as a criminal act in the eyes of their law. So to say that Scots and English law lagged behind our European neighbours in this regard would be an understatement. In 1889, Scots law was the last legal jurisdiction in Europe to abolish the death penalty for the crime of sodomy, replacing it with a sentence of two years in prison with hard labour. It was only in February 1981 that the law in Scotland changed to partially decriminalise same-sex relationships between men and then only for men aged 21 and over. Well, the age of consent for heterosexuals in Scotland has been 16 years old since 1885. It wasn't until 2001 that the age of consent between men in Scotland was set at 16, the same for everybody else. Remarkably, it was only in December 2013 that the very last anti-gay terminology was removed from the law in Scotland. Presiding officer, that's just under four and a half years ago. 
So whether it was the unequal age of consent or the damage caused by laws such as Section 28, our LGBTI fellow Scots suffered unfair treatment under our laws for far too long. In our stage one report, the committee has made various recommendations about how the pardon and disregard scheme proposed under the bill can be improved upon. My fellow committee members will speak to some of those recommendations during the debate and they all have their own areas of expertise. However, in the time I have left, I'd like to focus on two key themes to emerge from our scrutiny. Firstly, as a society, we must never take for granted the progress that we have made in tackling discrimination. This, that is why this bill really matters. It matters because it will help to improve the lives of men with unfair historical convictions by allowing them to have those convictions removed from their records. The disregard process will remove the discrimination they face when applying for certain jobs or serving as volunteers in their local communities or in some cases in the armed forces, which I hope one of my uh, uh, committee, fellow committee members will pick up later. But the bill also matters because it is a statement of principle, a statement of the kind of society Scotland wants to be today and seeks to be in the future. That is why the Scottish Government must work to promote the understanding of this bill as widely as possible. It must encourage all those men with a relevant historical conviction to apply for the disregard. Presiding officer, we heard from witnesses similar legislation in England and Wales has resulted in a very low number of disregard applications. This is partly because the English system is more limited in the range of offences it covers, and partly because of confusion about the effect of a pardon and the belief it automatically removes an offence from somebody's records, which it does not. This is the role of the disregard process. But the scheme being established in Scotland will cover a wider range of criminal offences under which gay men were convicted, such as loitering. These offences may not currently be included in the uh, English system, but I believe they're looking at how we roll out ours and maybe, hopefully, they will make more progress as time goes on. So, presiding officer, it's vital to the success of the bill that the Scottish Government works to ensure that this is clearly understood. That is why the design, the operation of the disregard application process is of central importance and why I agree with my colleague Jamie Green when he intervened on the Minister. It has to be clear. First impressions matter. So the first impression an applicant has of the disregard scheme will determine how many men seek to apply in Scotland. Someone's first impression must not be to have to fill in an off-putting application form, as in the case with the current Home Office application scheme in England. Neither must the experience be one of confusion over the level of information which may need to be pro provided about the historical conviction here. Daniel Johnson. I was wondering if the member would agree with me that, and I completely agree with her points around the simplicity of the system and the importance of that, but also awareness of the system, given that people must apply for it, is, is equally important. I'm wondering if she'd agree with me that the minister might give more comment on that in the summing up at the end of the debate. Christina McKelvey. Yeah, I know that other colleagues uh, in the debate this afternoon will raise those very points, but um, I was just about to go on to that, so it was good time, and, uh, Mr Johnson. So, the applicant has to be able to seek that advice and that support and that's one thing that came through clearly in the evidence that we took that people don't want an onerous system and they want a system that's clear they also want a system that allows them to to gather the information that, that they need and that information has to be as simple as possible as well well the information required for the disregard can be sought in due course, the first step in the application process must be as user-friendly as possible, and that came through very, very clear in the evidence that we'd taken. Bad experiences can generate bad word of mouth about the scheme, and this coupled with confusion about whether it is limited, whether it is as limited as an English scheme, may persuade some men in Scotland that it is not worth applying for the disregard when we don't want them to do that. So to avoid this situation, the committee has recommended that the design of the application process be user-led, and we would like more comments on that in your summing up, Minister. Key LGBTI organisations in Scotland should play a greater role, and we know that you've committed to that, but we want to just impress that on you. They should play a leading role in the design and delivery of the application system for a disregard. So in conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, the Equality Human Rights Committee is very proud um, to play a part in helping put right this historic wrong. We are very proud that we have a unanimous report to put to Parliament today and we are very proud to back the general principles of the Historical Sexual Offences Pardon and Disregard, Disregards Scotland Bill. Thank you. I now call on Annie Wells to open for the Conservatives. Seven minutes thereabouts, Ms Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to mark my support for this milestone bill at stage one, particularly having followed its development as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Following the party leader's statements last November, 
which offered an unequivocal apology to any gay men convicted of sexual offences that no longer illegal. I think we were all struck in the chamber by the poignancy of a bill that sought to officially mark and right the wrong wrongdoings of the past. This is a landmark bill, and it's important that we spread the message of what exactly it's about. Not only so those affected can receive the justice they deserve, but also because of the important signal that this will send out regarding Scotland being a world leader in the LGBTI equality. Importantly, this bill isn't to erase from history the injustices that took place, but rather give comfort to those affected, including in some cases their friends and family, and to provide an opportunity for them to really move on with their lives. Yes. Alec Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Annie Wells for giving way. Does your member agree with me that it's important that we not erase this history because to do so would be to create a revisionist history. We need to remind future generations of this stain on our national conscience. Annie Wells. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with um, the member's comments there and we shouldn't be um, erasing history. We have to see what history was like for everyone and for the future generations in Scotland. But we are not able to rewrite history and we don't want to. And the paths of some for whom the discriminatory legislation will have changed the course of their lives irreversibly. And as was pointed out during the committee sessions, many affected have sadly taken their own lives and some will have spent time in prison. We cannot account for the numbers of men who still to this day may have chosen a different path in life altogether had they been given the choice. For everyone, I'm sure most of whom will be in their 50s and upwards, the mental scars will remain. And if we look at the bill in the context of the journey towards LGBTI equality, it's hard to believe that these discriminatory laws are in the living memory of most of us here in the chamber today. Amazingly, until 1980, same-sex sexual activity between men was an offence regardless of where it took place, in public or at private in, or in the private home. And it wasn't until 2001 that the age of consent was reduced to 16, equal with opposite sex relationships. In the period between men could still be prosecuted for activities such as kissing in public, and as Kezia Dugdale alluded to, chatting up other men. And during a private evidence session, we heard from a, an anonymous witness who in the early 90s was charged with intent to commit a homosexual act in a public place after having kissed a man in the street at the age of 20. And it's astonishing now to think that gay men were persecuted and criminalised in this way simply because of their sexuality. This is why the bill is so important. It provides an opportunity to draw a line under these laws by offering a pardon to those affected and by giving those convicted for these offences an opportunity to have them disregarded. As became apparent during the committee's evidence sessions and through research around this, compensation was not something widely sought, rather the symbolic acknowledgement that the laws themselves were discriminatory. Importantly, as we build on the legislation south of the border, the bill offers this pardon to all those affected living and dead, and it's clear that this will only apply if the relevant conviction is for something which is no longer a crime. I sincerely hope that this can provide some comfort to those affected. As we know, although discriminatory laws have been repealed, the burden of criminal conviction can still linger on. Police Scotland have identified up to 1,261 offences against 994 people which fall within the scope of the bill, and this is likely to increase. While it's overwhelmingly likely that such convictions will be spent convictions, it is possible that when applying for a role for a higher level disclosure is required, these convictions can be revealed. And as we also heard during evidence sessions, these convictions can have a detrimental impact on people's lives. With witness A speaking of how it had hindered his career, and witness B, the embarrassment it had caused as part of his work in the voluntary groups. It's absolutely right that the bill will introduce a system whereby those with convictions can apply to have them disregarded. And I sincerely hope that this can lift some of the burden of conviction. 
And on that point, I believe there is more we can talk about and discuss as the Bill progresses. During committee sessions, it became clear that work would have to be done around the disregard process in order to advertise as such its existence and to make it abundantly clear that despite the pardon, people still have to go through the separate process of applying for a disregard. As intimated during evidence sessions, when a witness had told us that having asked a couple of his friends about the bill, they knew nothing about it. Therefore, we cannot assume that this information will naturally disseminate into the wider public. We need to be proactive in publicising it, recognising that not all gay men, particularly those in more remote areas, are linked with the LGBTI groups. And furthermore, there is still some way to go in ironing out the manner in which convictions are removed from all official records, for example, by organisations who do not hold criminal records, such as National Records of Scotland, the NHS and employer groups who may hold this information. We still, of course, have a long way to go. As we saw in the work of the Committee on Prejudice-Based Bullying, there is much work to be done. And I was too proud to support the work of the Thai campaign in introducing LGBTI education into our schools. LGBTI hate crime statistics remain worryingly high. And globally, we still see the persecution of LGBTI people with gay relationships still being criminalised in 72 countries across the world. To finish the day, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would, like, I would like again to reiterate my support for the bill at stage one. For those affected and as a marker of societal progress of attitudes, the importance of this bill cannot be underestimated. As Ruth Davison so helpfully put it in her own statement, this is one jigsaw piece in the fight for true LGBTI equality, but nevertheless, a very large one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Mary Fee to open for Labour. Ms Fee, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I am extremely grateful to have the opportunity to open this afternoon's debate for Scottish Labour on the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregard Scotland Bill. And can I start by taking the opportunity to thank and express my gratitude to the men who gave evidence to the committee. Their testimonies were both revealing and brave. And that evidence about the impact that criminalisation has had on their lives, the shame and the confusion that they have suffered, brought this legislation to life and gave the committee a real understanding of the impact that criminalisation has had and the importance of this piece of legislation. I'd also like to thank my fellow committee members and the committee clerks for their assistance and support throughout, helping to pull together our various evidence sessions, discussions and recommendations in order to produce our stage one report. And I am pleased to see that there is a, a clear consensus among members of all political parties for this bill. The Historic Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregard Scotland Bill is of significant importance as it explicitly recognises the historic wrongs of the justice system and seeks to provide a means of redress against the hateful and intrusive discrimination experienced by gay men in Scotland as a result of the criminalisation of all sexual activity between men prior to 1981. And in Scotland, we are often eager to portray our country as a beacon of egalitarianism and inclusivity. And this is a very worthy aspiration and a worthy vision to hold. But we should not forget our nation's history and our nation's wrongdoings. As recently as 1980, men in Scotland could be prosecuted based on their sexual orientation. A man could be prosecuted for expressing their love for another man. Not only were all forms of sexual activity deemed to be illegal, but all expressions of affection were also curbed, as has been previously discussed, such as kissing in public places, which could be prosecuted as it was classified as gross indecency. And through this repressive, regressive legal system, the courts in Scotland criminalised and discriminated against thousands of men on the basis of their sexual orientation. And this was unequivocally wrong. 
No one should be criminalised based on their sexual orientation or their expression of love for someone with the same gender identity. The legacy of convictions, cautions, warnings and fines as a result of discriminatory laws prohibiting sexual activity being between men in Scotland have had an enduring, a hurtful and a damaging impact on thousands of men's lives. And it was absolutely right for the First Minister to offer an unequivocal, an unequivocal and an unqualified apology to these men for these wrongs. And in relation to the contents of the Historic Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregard Scotland Bill, I am glad that it has a broad scope which reflects some of the more problematic elements of the equivalent legislation in England and in Wales. And Stonewall Scotland have highlighted that our proposed legislation is stronger and is more accessible and more appropriate than its equivalent in England and Wales. With our proposed legislation ensuring that the pardon in the bill applies automatically to all people with the specified conviction, whether they are living or they have passed away. And this is an important distinction, as in England and Wales, the legislation grants a pardon to men who have died before the 31st of January 2017, meaning that men who are still alive have to apply for a statutory pardon. And the result of this has been that only a very small percentage of living men in England and Wales with discriminatory convictions have applied and received that pardon. And despite its eminent strengths, I do hope that the Scottish Government will provide additional clarification in relation to the disregard system. It is vitally important that the Government take the lead in establishing a framework for the disregard system, which is uncomplicated, which is easily accessible and which is supportive of all men or the families of deceased men who will engage in this process. Yes, certainly. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank Mary Fee very much for the intervention? Because it just struck me uh, in thinking about Daniel Johnson's intervention earlier as well, and in additionality to Mary's points there, that does she agree with me that Disclosure Scotland has a role to play in advertising the provisions of the bill and the application through the process through both its written and online media? Because I think if Disclosure Scotland can take the lead on some of this, then we can target the, the information much more effectively. Mary Fee. Yeah, I, I absolutely uh, agree with um, Christina McKelvey's intervention. I think Disclosure Scotland have a very important and, and almost pivotal, pivotal role in, in how this um, legislation, how the disregard um, system will uh, progress. And in establishing the framework for the disregard system, the Scottish Government should also guarantee that there are sufficient financial resources for this purpose. And without a properly established, structured and funded framework for the disregard system, there is a danger that the aspirations of the bill may not be reflected in reality. And we also need to be sure that adequate support is provided for both men and for their families. Many men will not have spoken about their conviction and reliving the trauma may be very distressing for both the individual, for their partners and for their families. An area which I personally explored through our evidence sessions was the situation surrounding family members seeking redress on behalf of a deceased relative. And I understand that the pardon applies to deceased men and that is very important. However, there may be circumstances where a family wants something more than a symbolic pardon for their deceased family member. And I understand the difficulties surrounding this. However, I would be grateful as this bill progresses if the government could explore ways to assist family members in this regard. And I fully appreciate that this bill, through offering an automatic pardon and the opportunity to apply for a disregard, cannot undo the bullying, the discrimination, the harassment and the victimisation which has been experienced by gay men in Scotland, nor can it mitigate the damage done to their families. However, to the men and the families affected by this bill, I truly hope and believe that it can be a significant step in the process of reconciliation by admitting the justice system's wrongdoings and the discriminatory treatment of gay men by giving them a legal pardon as an acknowledgement of their innocence. Too often we focus on the positive contribution that Scotland has made to the world. Today is a time for us to reflect and to be open in acknowledging and accepting the wrongdoings of our past. 
And in coming to a close, presiding officer, I'd like to once again reiterate my full support for the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill as an important part of the process of redressing the historic discriminatory treatment of gay men. It's right that we acknowledge the historic wrongs which have been committed. Only through acknowledging historic wrongs can we endeavour as one Scottish Parliament to work towards our common goal of creating a modern Scotland, a nation which celebrates our diversity, which promotes inclusivity and which strives for equality. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Patrick Harvey to the Green Party. Um, six minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I commend the Government for its bill and the Committee for its work in leading scrutiny of it? It is an important step in a very long journey. Uh, and at a moment like this, I'm particularly aware, as someone who's been out in my job as an MSP, I'm particularly aware of the debt that I owe uh, to those who faced much greater risks than I have uh, to, taking, to take those much earlier steps uh, in this journey. By the time I came out uh, as a, uh, a young man, uh, it was nearly 10 years since decriminalization had begun in Scotland. Uh, and there were debates on equalizing the age of consent at Westminster. And yet those proposals for equality were rejected at that time by MPs. And it was just a few years since Section 28 had been created. So there's been much progress, but it's been by no means an easy journey, by no means a straightforward one. And every step of the way, uh, the case for equality has been fought against. This parliament to date has never actively voted against equality for our lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender uh, and intersex citizens. And yet equality for those diverse communities is still seen as something optional in our political landscape, still seen as something optional. And there are many MSPs who repeatedly voted for discriminatory laws who are still here today. And so as we take this important step, I think it's important that we make the statement that underpins it mean something. All of us should go back, go back to our political parties and we should insist on the case that prejudice and discrimination against LGBTI people should be no more acceptable in our policies or in our candidate selection than racism, anti-Semitism, sectarianism, or any other form of bigotry. That, I think, uh, accompanying passing this bill uh, would make the, the statement more meaningful. I'd like to offer a couple of recollections from my time as a, an LGBT youth worker in Glasgow. One of the last pieces of work I had to do in that job before I, uh, I joined this parliament was a, a timeline exercise. It was part of a, a training pack for other mainstream youth workers to, to deal with uh, LGBTI issues. Uh, people would draw a card and it would uh, involve a statement or a, a moment from history or an image and, and the challenge would be simply to place it on the timeline from a cave painting from 8000 BC uh, up to, uh, the, I think the, the most current issue was uh, the German government uh, issuing a formal apology uh, to those who were persecuted for their sexual orientation uh, during the Holocaust. And in trialling this timeline exercise with the young people in my own youth group, young out LGBT people, when somebody drew the card, decriminalisation of male homosexuality, the overwhelming reaction was one of puzzlement, of bafflement. These were young people growing up without the idea in their head. Now that's in many ways a failing of our history, a failing of our teaching of history, but the idea that those young people were growing up without the notion that their lives would ever have been made criminal in the first place, an extraordinary kind uh, of liberation. A second recollection from that period was of a, a guy who came into the, the Glasgow Lesbian and Gay Centre, this before that organisation had, had added the extra parts of the acronym that, we, that we're familiar with today. The Glasgow Lesbian and Gay Centre uh, you know, saw many people just drop in on spec to, to access services or to, or to meet somebody. This guy was taking his very first steps, his very first experience of coming out to anyone in the world, and he was in his late 70s. His mother had just died. 
He'd been brought up in a, a strict religious environment. He'd never had any sense or, or expectation that he would be able to explore or express that aspect of his, his personality or his sexuality. And this in his late 70s was that first moment. We can apologize for wrong that was done. We can agree pardons and disregards. We can change the law to prevent future injustice, but we can't change history. And not only uh, that man who uh, might even regret never having had the chance to do something that would even risk wrongful arrest at the time, that aspect of his life simply never came uh, to exist. Not only him, but many others uh, younger than him will never know what it's like to grow up in a society in which they are valued, respected, validated, and safe. I don't want to overly romanticize all of this. And it's not all about victimhood either, because the identities, the communities, the cultures and subcultures of queer people down the ages have often been defined in response to and in defiance of legal and cultural persecution. That story is one that's painful and harmful, but it's also one of strength and creativity. And I don't want that part of our history to be forgotten either. Two final uh, comments that I'd like to make, presiding officer, uh, on this. I understand entirely why uh, it's easy to fall into uh, language such as uh, it's, it's wrong that people face prosecution for who they loved. And to be sure, it is. But maybe they were just having sex as well. I, I think we need to guard against moving from being anti-gay to being anti-sex. Sex doesn't need to be validated by love. It's wonderful if people want and have a loving relationship in their life, or more than one. It's also wonderful if they want and have a good sex life too, and they shouldn't need anyone's pardon for that either. Finally, presiding officer, I want to reflect on a comment that the Prime Minister made this week addressing the Commonwealth heads of government. The Prime Minister is someone that I will disagree with on a great many issues, but she's also someone who has had the, uh, the chance to reflect on and to recognize that she got it wrong on LGBTI equality issues in the past uh, and needs to acknowledge that. And acknowledging the British Empire's history of imposing many discriminatory laws in other countries, she said these laws were wrong then and they are wrong now. This is part of a global challenge as well as one in history and it must form part of our international engagement. Uh, and so finally, presiding officer, may I urge the government to present a copy of this bill to our guest, the president of Malawi, at his visit later this month. Uh, and discuss the issues with him. Thank you. I, I've given a bit of leeway for opening speeches because I have some time in hand, but I can't give too much leeway. I now want to call on, uh, that's not to scold you, Mr. Cole Hamilton, before you even start. I call on Ali Cole Hamilton to open for the Liberal Democrats. And I'll give you a little bit of leeway as I gave it to the Greens. I'm fair. Our fair, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it is my great privilege and pride to open for the Liberal Democrats on what is a, in many ways a historic day and to speak as I do in my capacity as Deputy Convener for the Equalities and Human Rights Committee who have brought this legislation to this point. When I was little, my grandfather got involved in amateur dramatics. He wasn't very good, but I say this because the role I remember him playing most was that of a judge in a play called Breaking the Code about the life and trial of Alan Turing. Now, that was very important to my grandfather because he'd always thought of Alan Turing as a national hero. He felt that his intelligence work at Bletchley had turned the tide of the war in the no North Atlantic, where my grandpa had been a, a, an officer on a destroyer. And he felt that despite this herodom, that Alan Turing had been terribly ill-used by both the British establishment and the judiciary in what happened to him, which ultimately brought about his destruction. So I think it's absolutely right that we, we grapple with this today. And I am grateful for the government for bringing it forward because this bill is an opportunity for us as a parliament to say to those men who felt compelled to live in the shadows because of who they were, step forward. 
step forward and receive the justice that has been denied to you. This nation is profoundly sorry for the harm that it has done you. So this has been an, an amazing bill to be part of. I've really enjoyed the work of our committee in grappling with it because the, the story of Alan Turing is reflected in those of thousands of men across these islands, both alive and dead. And each of them is steeped in persecution, in wrongful arrest, and sometimes in tragedy. And this is an opportunity for us to right a historic wrong. And I really want to pay tribute to the work of my fellow members, the, the Clarks, uh, Spice and researchers, but also the, those many people who gave us evidence as well. In particular, the LGBT rights organizations like Stonewall, Tim Hopkins in particular from the Equalities Network, who gave us an amazing discourse in, in the history of this legislation and what we could and couldn't do about it. And in particular, the two gentlemen who've been referenced who gave evidence in private. We learn from early doors that we can't just give an automatic disregard to everybody to whom this applies for the reasons the Cabinet Secretary outlined. It is just too difficult to infer what was meant by breach of the peace or gross indecency when that uh, offence was handed out. So a process of application it must be. But I would like to associate myself with the remarks of other members in this chamber who said that we should strive in the implementation of this bill to make that process far easier and less intrusive than it has been in other parts of the British Isles. We also learned that whilst there is indeed an impulse, a, an understandable impulse, to delete this entirely from our records, as I intervened on Annie Wells, that, uh, that it is actually, it would have the effect of creating a sort of revisionist history, that this is a stain on our national conscience. It is part of our fabric, and we need to remind future generations of what went before and the suffering of those it affected. We learned about the work of other countries, and in particular, I want to reference Germany, because I was very struck that in Germany, not only do they offer a pardon and a disregard, but they also uh, give out a certificate and make a payment of compensation of a minimum of 4,000 euros in each case. And I explored this at, at every stage of our evidence gathering process. I was keen to pursue that issue of compensation, given that we are actually only talking about perhaps 50 or so men coming forward in, in the Scottish context. To offer them financial recompense shouldn't be too onerous for the Scottish government. However, I and the rest of the committee were very struck and indeed humbled by the quiet indifference of those people giving us evidence. This is not what this is about for them. And it simply it never occurred to many of them. And it was, I think is a measure of the character and, and the humble stoicism that they exhibited. In fact, in one case, one of the men who gave us evidence in the private session actually brought a, a, across a peal of laughter when I asked him if he felt compensation should be offered. And without missing a beat, he said, well, you can start by paying me my 40 shilling sh fine back that I got for loitering in a toilet. So I think to do so would create a subjective hierarchy of suffering. It's not what organizations or individuals are looking for. They are looking just for justice. So I want to reference also the work of a number of other members, in particular Mary Fee, and I was very struck by her line of questioning about how we extend this posthumously, the disregard element of this bill, to those families who want to seek the same level of justice that living uh, people can attain. I also want to thank Jamie Green in particular for his work around a line of questioning on the uh, Ministry of Defence and the fact that in our armed services there are many men who are stripped of commission and rank and sub subjected to all kinds of abuse because of their sexuality and we're very gratified to receive a very detailed response from the Ministry of Defence which represents something of an open door that I'm sure that our committee will continue uh, to push on. So as I said, presiding officer, this has been a lovely, lovely piece of legislation to work on. It's the kind of bill you come to Parliament to do. It makes your heart sing. And to meddle it with, with it by amendment at stage two is almost irresistible for opposition politicians. But I pledge to do very little of that and, unless it's in the context of what we've described uh, with Mary Fee's amendment. And can I finish then just by thanking again my co colleagues on the committee for this great experience. It has been a great experience. And, and I think it's something my grandfather would be very proud of me for doing because it was him that first gave me my insight, uh, my first insight into the persecution that the LGBT plus community had suffered in these islands. And today we go some way to writing that wrong. Thank you. You do appreciate your commitment to non-meddling is now irrefutably on the record.
I now move to the open debate. I call Gail Ross to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I have also been really honoured to play my part in taking this issue forward. And like our fellow committee members, I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. And I also thank everyone that has gotten us to this point. For far too long, members of our LGBTI community were convicted under discriminatory law and considered criminals for conduct which was only illegal because of their sexuality. This bill will remove the remnants of this regrettable part of Scotland's past. It is welcome that attitudes towards LGBTI people continue to advance. Three years ago, the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey showed that the percentage of people who viewed same-sex relationships positively doubled this century from 37% in 2000 to 69% in 2015. And there is still a way to go, President Officer, but it is clear that this legislation is in step with popular opinion. The bill has two important features which relate to historical sexual offences, pardons and disregards. We discuss both subjects in detail during committee stage and I would like to discuss some of the aspects of both here today. During our committee work, Tim Hopkins of the Equality Network raised the concerns of some gay men about the use of the word pardon. He said, quote, they were uncomfortable about being told that they were pardoned because that implied that they had done something wrong, unquote. And it's crucial that we make clear that these men did nothing wrong. Of course, a pardon is the correct legal remedy to apply here, but we must all work as hard as possible to go beyond this. We must take every opportunity to explain that we are not excusing misconduct and misdemeanour, we are righting historic wrongs. As a parliament, we should echo the sentiments expressed by the First Minister when the bill was introduced. We say to those who were wronged, you are not only pardoned, but we are sorry. The committee also heard compelling evidence in relation to the disregard process. One of our anonymous witnesses, who we are all very rightly proud of, kindly shared his experience discussing the difficulties his conviction has caused in his working life. His story really gets to the need for the disregard outlined in sections 5 to 11 of this bill. Because his job required protection of vulnerable groups or PVG checks, the witness had to undergo enhanced disclosure searches of criminal records. Now these would not normally be a cause for concern, but in the early 90s, our witness had kissed someone in the street. Now, people in this chamber may have kissed someone on the street. You may have been on a date. You may have been greeting, leaving a spouse, a partner, a close friend. But because this man was gay and the person he kissed was another man, he was convicted of intent to commit a homosexual act in a public place. And every time he has thought about applying for a new job or an internal promotion, he has to ask himself, do I want to explain this all over again? Do I want to discuss my sexuality and my unjust conviction? He and others in his position deserve to be able to get on with their lives without worrying about when they will next have to open up about a historic wrong enacted on them by the state. As a committee, as has been said, we took evidence on whether or not the disregard should be automatic as the pardon is. Several witnesses stated that this cannot happen for a number of reasons. One, some of the convictions the men currently hold are ones such as breach of the peace or some obscure bylaw that no one has hardly ever heard of. Two, we can only disregard things that are no longer crimes when the bill comes into force, so this makes a blanket scheme impossible. And three, some of these men simply want to forget that this ever happened to them and would simply not appreciate it being brought up without any permission or warning on their behalf. We need to make sure that people are aware they can apply for the disregard. We need to make sure it's transparent and easy to access. And there have been a number of good points covering that already. Remember that some of these men may not have exact times and dates or even know the nature of the offence. It is therefore vital that the disregard scheme is widely advertised, is simple to use and is not adversarial. If we are going to make people explain a wrong committed against them one final time, we have to make sure that it's as painless as possible. Thankfully, the discriminatory laws which created these criminal convictions have been relegated to Scotland's past. 
but the convictions and their consequences still endure. This bill will hopefully go some way to change that. Its passage will remove the residues of an outdated law, banish the attitudes which justified it, and enact legislation which is in tune with our vibrant and progressive Scotland. Presiding officer, as stated previously, the First Minister has apologised to these men. Our committee will now take forward this legislation and I commend our report to the Chamber. Thank you. I call Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Rona Mackay. Ms Mitchell, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in the Stage 1 debate of this important historical sexual offences, pardons and disregard Scotland bill, which has cross-party support. This legislation is long overdue, acknowledging, as it does, the wrongfulness and discriminatory effect of past convictions for certain historical sexual offences where the actions were carried out by consenting adult males. Put simply, these offences were totally without justification, a fact formally recognised by this Parliament. Part two of the bill automatically offers pardons to men living or dead who were convicted of same-sex sexual activity, which is now legal, and, set out, and sets out the procedure for a pardon apology. This is an important provision, especially for the families of the men who were convicted and have since died, as it serves to help give their relatives closure. However, despite this pardon and this, these discriminatory laws having been repealed, previous convictions still stand, and this in turn continues to have a negative impact on those with these historic convictions, which could, for example, appear on a disclosure form relating to a job application. The bill therefore makes provision for the process of disregarding a range of relevant historic offences. Here the Law Society notes that the evidence from some of those affected by the discriminatory nature of these convictions has helped to ensure that the bill is comprehensive in its scope. The Law Society also states that the process to obtain legal aid, if required, should be as simple and well publicised as possible. And the committee heard evidence from Police Scotland that the process for the disregard system needs to be clear, efficient and quick. Deputy Presiding Officer, by enacting this landmark legislation, the Scottish Parliament is sending out a powerful message not only to those living in Scotland, but to the 72 countries that still criminalise same-sex relationships. These include eight countries where homosexuality may result in the death penalty, including Iran, Sudan, Saudi Arabia and Yemen. A chilling reminder that there are still huge challenges to be faced in the striving to secure equal rights, not just for all in Scotland, but beyond. More specifically, within the Commonwealth at present, 37 of the 53 Commonwealth countries do not have legal rights for same-sex people. These countries include India, Pakistan, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, Botswana and Malawi, to name but a few. Scotland is an active participant within the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and in particular, we have a special relationship with Malawi. So there is an opportunity here to move forward together with colleagues in the, the Commonwealth countries and within a climate of cooperation and mutual respect to try to effect change. It was therefore immensely heartening and encouraging that in her address to the Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference in London yesterday, the Prime Minister raised this issue within the context of addressing barriers to fairness and opportunity by stating. Certainly, Kezia Dugdale. I'm really, uh, encouraged to hear Margaret Mitchell's comments in this regard. She'll be aware that the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association meets in Uganda next year. I'd be interested in her thoughts on what she thinks the Scottish Parliament's role is in addressing LGBT rights in Uganda, which are getting worse at the moment. 
Margaret Mitchell. It is very much as I've just said, and I hope to develop that in, in commenting from um, what the, the, the Prime Minister very eloquently and um, strongly said yesterday. Discriminatory laws made many years ago continue to affect the lives of many people, including criminalising same-sex relations. I am all, all too aware that these laws were often put in place by my own country. And as Patrick Harvey quoted, they were wrong then and they are wrong now. As the UK's Prime Minister, I deeply regret both the fact that such laws were introduced and the legacy of discrimination, violence and even death that persists today. We must respect one another's cultures and traditions, but we must do so in a manner consistent with our common value of equality. Nobody should face persecution or discrimination for who they are or who they love. More encouragingly still, Deputy Presiding Officer, these words were matched with the pledge that the UK stands ready to support any Commonwealth member wanting to reform outdated legislation that makes such discrimination possible. The Commonwealth's 53 countries are home to over 2 billion people. So Scotland and the UK's leadership on this issue has the ability to impact the millions of LGB people across the globe. In conclusion, presiding officers Christina McKelvey stressed raising public awareness of the bill will be crucial to ensure that potential applicants know that they have the right to have a conviction disregarded. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Ms Mackay, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to speak today in stage one of this vital piece of legislation, legislation which will remove the shameful stigma and address the historic wrong which was done to men who were convicted of a crime which should never have been a crime. Make no mistake about it, the discriminatory effect of convicting men for being in same-sex relationships for simply being themselves lingers on and this bill will draw a line under this discrimination once and for all. Mm. Presiding officer, Scotland has a proud record in leading the way in LGBTI equality. Of course, we still have work to do, but I'm proud that it's this parliament that is bringing this bill forward. And I'm also proud that it has got such great cross-party support. It delivers on a commitment made in the programme for government when it was published in September. As you know, my friend and former colleague, uh, John Nicholson's private member's Turing bill, which was uh, mentioned by uh, Alex Cole Hamilton, was talked out in Westminster and it failed to reach the statute books a totally shameful state of affairs. Of course, we can do better than that. We will end this injustice and consign these disgraceful convictions, quite literally, to history. At long last, the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill will also enable men to have convictions for same-sex sexual activity that's now legal, removed from central criminal, criminal conviction records. Mm. It will pardon those convicted of criminal offences for engaging in same-sex sexual activity, which is now legal, and put in place a system to enable a person with such a conviction to apply to have it disregarded so that information about the conviction held in records generally maintained by Police Scotland doesn't show up in a disclosure check. The bill applies to discriminatory historical convictions for sex between men, but is otherwise gender neutral, meaning that it will apply equally to trans women and non-binary people who were convicted as men. In addition to the pardon, the bill includes a statement on its purpose that it acknowledges the wrongfulness and discriminatory effect of past convictions for certain historical sexual offences. Presiding officer, as the cabinet secretary outlined and, and Gail Ross mentioned, I was concerned that the term pardon might still imply to some people that parliament sees them as having done something wrong. That's after all a common context in which a pardon might be granted. But these men did nothing wrong and were grossly discriminated against by this legislation. The wrong was committed by the state, not individuals. And I think that's worth repeating. On the bill's introduction, the First Minister said, parliamentarians in Scotland over many decades supported or have at the very least accepted laws, which we now recognise to have been completely unjust. Those laws criminalise the act of loving another adult. They deter people from being honest about their identity to family, friends, neighbours and colleagues. 
and by sending a message from Parliament that homosexuality was wrong, they encouraged rather than deterred homophobia and hate. So today, categorically and wholeheartedly, I apologise for those laws and for the hurt and harm that they caused. Presiding officer, back in the so-called good old days prior to 1981, all sexual activity between men in Scotland was a criminal offence in all circumstances. The so-called homosexual offences of sodomy and gross indecency applied specifically to sex between men. Men were also prosecuted under other laws, including shameless indecency, local bylaws and breach of the peace. Like others have said, I find it incredible that this was happening so recently. While researching for this debate, I was constantly amazed at the scale of this inequality and injustice and confessed to feeling ashamed that I was not aware of it at this time at that time. Slowly but surely during the 80s, starting in 1981, sex between men was decriminalised step by step. There was a higher age of consent between 1981 and 1994, and then of 18 until 2001 when the age was equalised at 16. There was also special, more restrictive rules about privacy until 2001. But the law continued to use discriminatory language for sex between men, such as gross indecency, until 2010, and the common law offence of sodomy was only finally abol abolished in 2013, when the new sexual orientation neutral framework for sexual offences fully came into effect. As many colleagues have said, it's important to note that not only sexual activity was criminalised, but affectionate activity, such as kissing in a public place, which could be prosecuted in gross indecency and even breach of the peace. Statistics highlight that several thousands of men were convicted in Scotland under the old homosexual offences of sodomy and gross indecency under local bylaws. The Equality Network estimate the, to estimate the total number of convictions to which the Pardon Bill applies to be in the small number of thousands. Many men so convicted will no longer be living, and so the Equality Network estimate that the number of convictions covered by the bill for men still living is possibly a small number of hundreds. This is the number to which the disregard in the bill applies, as well as the pardon. Presiding officer, I'm pleased that the memory of those no longer with us remain, will remain untarnished. Scotland is a tolerant society and is fully committed to respecting, protecting and implementing human rights and demanding equality, dignity and respect. The introduction of this bill endorses that position and I am pleased to support stage one of this bill. Thank you. I call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Ms Dugdale, please. Thank you, Ms. Officer. I spent the weekend in Bosnia studying the genocide and the 44-month war that took place between 1992 and 1995, and in particular its impact on women. It was estimated that throughout that war, somewhere between 25 and 50,000 people were raped during that time. Largely women, but around 1,000 men too, raped by soldiers. Sexual offences used as weapons of war. And rape was considered the best way to ethnically cleanse villages because people would flee in fear of the soldiers who were going to advance into their towns. And I met women over the weekend who for over 20 years now have been fighting for justice, pursuing the men that raped them so long ago. That's what I consider a historic sexual offence, not the crime of two men being criminalised for their love of sex or indeed their love of each other. And I think the point that Patrick Harvey made about us not sanitising the language here is really important or trying to talk about it in PG terms. So can I commend the committee and, the, and its convener for a thorough and inclusive report and lend my support to the bill at stage one. The stage one report shows uh, that the issues that we are dealing with aren't even that historic as, been, as has been mentioned before. The law has only been entirely equal and sexual orientation neutral since 2013 when the final aspects of the 2009 Act came into effect, a point well made by Christina McKelvey in her opening remarks. The report is also very sensitive and as others have mentioned, particularly with regards to witness A and witness B who were clearly given the space and the confidence to share their stories. And I think that's a credit uh, to the committee, but also a credit to this parliament standing that we were trusted in that way with the stories of their lives. Witness A, who's been mentioned by Annie Wells and Gail Ross, was 20 in the early 90s. He got a criminal record for kissing a man in the street. This wasn't the 1920s, the 60s, the 70s, or even the 80s. It was in the 1990s. Witness A's life, from what I can see from the report, 
wasn't destroyed, but it was materially affected. He was living a successful life in his job and has been promoted several times in that post. But he spent his life fearing applying for other jobs for the fear that his disclosure check would categorise him as a sex offender. A sex offender for kissing someone in the street. And that is why this bill matters. It matters to the people it directly affects. And the Equality Network, in an excellent briefing, have attempted to quantify it. They tell us that the majority of gay men will have likely broken the law at some point in their lives pre-1981. That several thousand of those gay men were convicted. Thousands of those offences are no longer a crime. That most of the people convicted are now dead. And the Equality Network believe it affects perhaps a few hundred men alive today, but many, many more families of those who have passed away. It also matters because legislation is key to challenging attitudes. And we know from the statistics and from the numbers that in, 2000, in the year 2000, 37% of the UK population supported same-sex relationships, but it has risen to 69% just 15 years later in 2015. And I believe it's no coincidence that both civil partnerships and equal marriage happened in that time. Plus, the defeat of Section 2A, adoption rights introduced for gay couples, the lift on the ban of LGBT people serving in the military, the introduction of hate crime legislation, plus so many other progressive measures. Three things very specifically, presiding officer, on the bill. I was delighted to see such a clear statement in Section 1 of the bill, which states beyond all doubt that what happened was wrong, and discriminatory. It's there on the first page. Secondly, recommendation 77, which focuses on the process being straightforward and user-friendly as possible, is absolutely critical. Again, something which Christina McKelvey referenced in her opening remarks. And it's absolutely essential that the form isn't off-putting. The rape clause was a horrible policy before DWP produced the form, but the form made it even worse. What we have here is a great policy, the potential of which can only be fully realised if the form is sensitive, straightforward and accessible. And whilst I wouldn't ask the Cabinet Secretary to legislate for the paperwork, I would appreciate a commitment that the excellent collaborative relationship that he's built with the LGBT community will continue and extend as far as the details such as this, and that no form should be introduced without their fulsome support for it. Thirdly, as I said, the apology from the First Minister at the time was fulsome, heartfelt and unequivocal, but it should be repeated over and over again. So I support the Equality Network's call that the pardons and disregards should be accompanied by a written apology in the form of a letter. I think that would be a wonderful move. In closing, Presiding Officer, as I've learned in Bosnia and here, history is rubbish at telling and recording the story of women. I said that last year when this bill was first announced. This apology, this pardon, doesn't apply to women. The reality is that it was never considered a sexual offence for two women to be together. That doesn't mean that over centuries we've been more tolerant of women or lesbians being together. It's just that the law never considered that women could be involved in sexual activity. As a consequence, women often had to live as men to live their lives, and some were convicted of a criminal offence. They were convicted of fraud. But all of them were invisible, demeaned and ostracised punished in a different way and painted out of history. Now, I'm not seeking the scope of this bill to be extended, just the story of women to be told alongside it. Because the LGBT community speaks with one voice on this issue and it supports this bill wholeheartedly at stage one. Thank you. Thank you, I call on Fulton McGregor to be followed by Liam Kerr. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. And I commend the government for taking through such an important bill in the fight for LGBT I write in the chamber today. And though Scotland has grown to become a leading example within Europe for its promotion of progressiveness and acceptance of the LGBTI community, there are still relics of her intolerant past that need to be addressed to truly support all Scottish people. As others have said, same sexual activities between men was considered a criminal offence in Scotland as recently as 1980, the same year I was born. And I find this outrageous. 1980, The Shining and the Empire Strikes Back were the top films, Dallas, was the main programme on TV. Blondie had the number one single of the year. And yet, same-sex activities between men was still considered a criminal offence. Hate and discrimination in our society, therefore, is still a healing wound in our history. And it is our duty as representatives of the people to acknowledge and amend this shameful past. 
I applaud the First Minister for recognising the harmful impacts of our outdated legislation and offering her apologies to all those who experienced the hate and discrimination it caused. And I also commend my colleague, Christina McKelvey, for taking the first step with this bill through the committee and providing a form of redress to the men who continue to face the impacts of the prejudice legislation. And I'm pleased to say that pending a, a motion tonight and before Parliament, I will become a member of the, the said committee and I look forward to um, scrutinising this uh, legislation at further, um, further stages. Scotland is no doubt a different place today than it was 30 or 40 years ago in terms of popular attitudes towards same sexual activity. For example, as others have said, a recent study done by the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey noted that the number of people in Scot Scottish society holding a positive view of same sex relationships has risen from 37% in 2000 to 69% by 2015, while those holding negative views has decreased from 48% to 18% over the same period. But I would note that 69% still seems a bit short and 18% a bit high. However, Criminal offences, eh, such as, as others have mentioned, men chatting up another man, remained until 2009, while the final deletion from Scots criminal law of terminology such as sodomy was only completed at the end of 2013. Clearly, social attitudes surrounding same-sexual relationships has far outpaced our political approaches to it, necessitating this Parliament to step up and create the legislation that properly recognises people to be fully equal citizens and who deserve equal respect. The purpose of this bill is therefore twofold. On a symbolic side, the passage of the bill sends out a loud and clear message to those who have been negatively impacted by the past legislation and to those whose hate has been emboldened by the official acceptance of its political representatives that the Scottish Parliament will no longer tolerate discrimination against the LGBTI community. The pardon acknowledges that the law should not have treated them as criminals and they should now, be considered, they should now not be considered to be criminals. Instead, the Scottish Parliament understands that the wrong was committed by the state, not the individual. Furthermore, this bill provides a form of redress by both pardoning those convicted of criminal offences for engaging in same-sex activ sexual activity, which is now legal, and by putting in place a system to enable a person with such a conviction to apply to have it disregarded, so that information about, about that conviction held in records generally maintained by Police Scotland does not show up in a disclosure check. The second part is particularly crucial as we have seen many examples of individuals who continue to face hardships due to their past criminal conviction, even though their crime is no longer considered a crime. And uh, we obviously heard Gail Ross and Kezia Dugdale uh, and Annie Wells use the example of the homosexual act of kissing another man in public and spoke about within the committee and him having to explain his conviction to his employers. It seems ridiculous to us now, but uh, as Kezia Dugdale highlighted, it wasn't even that long ago. And he noted that the difficulty in explaining his, con his conviction often put him off applying uh, for other positions and enhancing his career. And similarly, I also mentioned that another witness uh, who was charged in the 1980s with loitering in a public convenience under a local authority bylaw dating from the 1930s. Though the bylaw did not explicitly, explicitly criminalise homosexual behaviour, the witness said the intention of the regulation was clearly aimed at gay men. Although the witness had forgotten about the incident to his surprise, 40 years later, it came back up again on an enhanced disclosure he was required to submit as part of charitable work. The witness explained that he was fined 40 shillings for loitering equal two pounds today, nearly 40, 40 years ago when it shows up on an enhanced disclosure check today. Truly shocking. Someone fined under the same bylaw for failing to clear snow from the path outside their door would have been fined 40 shillings, but that conviction wouldn't show up 40 years later on an enhanced disclosure. When asked, both these witnesses said they would seek a disregard for their offences if given the chance. Presiding officer, I'd also like to take a moment to note the value of the, having the conviction disregarded instead of just pardoned, as a pardon implies that the inv individual has still done something wrong and the government is only excusing it and not necessarily acknowledging that it should not be treated as a wrong to begin with. Ultimately, this bill is one of the many actions the Scottish Parliament must take and is taking to continue its commitment to LGBTI equal rights in the past, the SNP Scottish Government introduced historic same-sex marriage legislation. When it was passed by the Scottish Parliament, it was recognised by many as being amongst the most progressive in the world. Additionally, the SNP have committed to reviewing and reforming gender, gender recognition law so that it is in line with international best practice for people who are transgender or intersex. The Scottish Government is also working with TIE to promote an inclusive approach to sex and relationships education through the Inclusive Education Working Group. Thus, this bill is in line with the goals 
of the Government, and I urge the Parliament to vote in favour of this Bill today. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like my colleagues before me, I will be pleased to agree to the general principles of the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill at decision time tonight. It is my view that the state should have a smaller role in, as sensibly possible in adjudicating on or prescribing consenting adults' business. Yet, since the Labouchere Amendment of 1885 made gross indecency a crime in the UK, and that was only four years after the death penalty for sodomy had been reduced to life imprisonment, the state has played two great a role. What is even worse is that that act contains no definition of gross indecency. Apparently as Victorian morality demurred from precise descriptions of activity held to be immoral. So you couldn't engage in certain behavior even in your own home in private but will not tell you precisely what that behavior is. And it wasn't until in 1980 it was made no longer illegal for those over 21 to have gay sex. And it's only within the last few decades or so that we have had an equal age of consent for both gay and straight sex, 116 years after it was set for opposite sex intercourse. Now, Annie Wells talked in opening about how attitudes have changed and talked of the crime of importuning. That is, according to the 2000 Moxon Report, a man chatting up another man, a crime until 2009. Attitudes have advanced, as many have noted this afternoon, and the law has spectacularly failed to keep pace. This opportunity is therefore welcome to pass a bill that not only offers a pardon, but also offers a mechanism to remove criminal records that persist for behavior that is no longer illegal. Now on that first point, part two of the bill offers a pardon to all those criminalized. This covers all consenting sexual acts between men who are over the age of consent for sexual activity as it is defined today, and where there was not a relationship of trust or responsibility. No rights are derived from the pardon and convictions are not overturned. It is a purely symbolic measure. Now, I do want to pick up on something the Cabinet Secretary raised and Gail Ross also examined. I do have sympathy for the view that the use of the word pardon is perhaps not ideal. In brief, I understand it was expressed to the committee that the semantics of the word pardon imply the pardoning of a committed crime. And I have sympathy with that analysis because... And, those who debated the continuity bill with me will know my fondness for dictionary definitions. Uh, pardon does generally mean to forgive or to excuse. And I think there could be a risk of insinuating that something less than normal took place for which there used to be a sanction and only due to societal attitudinal changes a pardon now required. I'm not sure I know what the solution is, if indeed any is required, but I, I do wish to express sympathy with that viewpoint and suggest it might be something to discuss as the bill progresses. Yes, of course. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. He's on the issue of semantics and definitions. I wonder if he would recognise that really there's no such thing as gay sex, it's just sex conducted by gay people and that language matters. Liam Kerr. Yeah, I absolutely would recognise that. And, uh, just, uh, I will go off the tangent slightly, I think Patrick Harvey made um, some very important points on that regard earlier, that a lot of the language around this, I think, has been about uh, love and loving relationships, and I think Patrick Harvey was absolutely right when he said, look, sometimes it's just sex, it's just people enjoying themselves. Or, uh, the se so, the second main limb is to give those convicted for these offences an opportunity to have them disregarded. Nearly 1,000 people currently have been identified by Police Scotland as having a criminal conviction on their record for a matter which is not an offence. The pardon doesn't remove that conviction, and it's possible, therefore, that these convictions could be required to be revealed, for example, in a job interview. Now, I think it is right to introduce a system which requires an application to have the convictions disregarded, because I do understand the view that the record could simply be wiped, and there's a danger that if it was perhaps legitimate, crimes could inadvertently be removed. But it is imperative, as a number of people have said, that the system set up is appropriate and it works. Not everyone is an activist. Not everyone is linked to the groups who've worked so hard to get us to this point. Not everyone will be aware that they require to actually take action to clear their record, uh, which Christina McKelvey made clear in her remarks is uh, likely to contribute to low uptake elsewhere. So the disregard process must be publicised extensively so people understand it is a necessary step. And then when it's developed, the disregard scheme must be as user-friendly as possible. I note that in the committee, 
Tim Hopkins said, because of the complexity of both the application form and the system, we estimate that only 2% of the people in England and Wales with those convictions still living have applied for the disregard. The committee recommended that the government cooperate closely with stakeholders in the design of the system, and I'm sure those comments will be taken on board going forward, given the Cabinet Secretary's response to Jamie Green earlier. In concluding then, I'm happy to support the principles of this bill and look forward to voting in favour today. Perhaps because no rights are derived from the pardon and convictions are not overturned, the pardon section is, to use the Cabinet Secretary's term, more symbolic. Perhaps the disregard process requires more work and thought. But let there be no doubt, the passing of this bill will mark a hugely important step in the fight to secure equal rights for all in Scotland, and I look forward to supporting it this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart Millen to be followed by Maurice Corey. Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, sometimes in life, doing the right thing, it might not be politically positive and sometimes might not get the backing of the public. Thankfully, this historical sexual offences, pardons and disregards at Scotland Bill is not one of those examples. Now, I believe that the time uh, for this bill has come and I commend all of my colleagues on the Qualities and Human Rights Committee for their excellent scrutiny of the bill leading to this uh, stage one uh, report and also uh, where we are today in the chamber. Now, we know that society changes, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly. And on this issue, it has been the latter, sadly. However, we are now in a better place, both politically and socially. And I am not aware of any constituent who has raised uh, any concern about this bill. But I do have constituents who are pleased and fully support this bill and what this parliament is trying to do. Now, days like this actually make me think uh, about uh, a local uh, SNP member who sadly uh, is uh, no longer alive. Uh, he was gay. Uh, he wanted a Scotland that uh, clearly was independent, but also a Scotland that had LGBTI equality. Now, I know that he would be proud uh, of this government in bringing the bill forward, but also proud of this parliament in working to help make Scotland uh, a country of equals and a country to be proud of. Now, this stage one report and uh, ministers, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, comments earlier highlight the desire uh, of this bill in making uh, some recourse to previous unjust laws. Now, the state uh, was wrong. And that clearly is a message that's come out from the chamber uh, this afternoon. The statement from the, the First Minister, which the Justice Secretary uh, mentioned earlier, was absolutely correct. The pardon is welcome. The apology is welcome, but the disregard is absolutely crucial. Now, I would expect uh, the disregard scheme to be as clear and, uh, and also unambiguous. The people who go through this process have suffered enough. And as a consequence, the, the very least that the state now can do is to make this process as seamless and as easy as possible. Now, presenting also the, uh, the law in the past uh, should not have treated people as criminals and they, and they should not now be considered to be criminals. Instead, uh, this Scottish Parliament now recognises that a wrong was done to them. Now, I touched upon earlier that society has uh, thankfully changed. And certainly Fulton McGregor uh, touched upon this in his uh, comments and, uh, regarding the, the Scottish Social Attitude Survey. And I think it's actually worthwhile putting this uh, on the record again. Uh, certainly, as the, the Attitude Survey had stated that the number of people in the Scottish society holding a positive view of same-sex relationships has, has risen from 37% in 2000 to 69% in 2015, while those holding negative views has decreased from 48% to 18% over the same period. Now, the 18%, in my opinion, is still far too high, but progress is certainly uh, being made. When we consider uh, how many legal actions uh, of the past uh, would be totally abhorrent now, uh, we must uh, appreciate that this bill is another step forward in dealing with discrimination. Scotland is now considered to be one of the most progressive countries in, in Europe when it comes to LGBTI equality. And Christina McKelvey, uh, the committee convener, spoke in detail uh, earlier on regarding the, the disregard scheme and uh, the opportunity that this bill uh, has uh, learning from the experiences from the legislation in Westminster. The section 26 of the committee report is therefore important in this regard. Also, at sections 109 to 115 of the committee report, 
uh, were of particular interest to me as uh, Deputy Convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and I'm sure that the, that the recommendation uh, to Section 115 uh, will be considered in due course uh, when the bill once again comes before the, that committee. But, presenting officer, some, someone's sexuality is a personal matter for them. I've got absolutely no desire or no need to be aware of, of, uh, of people's sexual orientation. Uh, I do believe that discrimination that has been in place for so long is a stain uh, on the past political classes who didn't see it as something that needed to be changed or fixed. Uh, Christine McKelvey and uh, other uh, colleagues highlighted the, the historical uh, legislation timeline earlier, and it's important uh, that this uh, was actually done today. I mean, consider uh, when everyone in this chamber considers uh, how, how recent law has actually been changed uh, in, in, this, uh, in this area, it just, it, it's really quite staggering to say the least. But fundamentally, this bill is about people. Our job is about people, and this parliament is about people. The psychological effect on many men uh, may not be totally resolved with the passing uh, of this bill. However, this bill will actually help redress many of the wrongs of the past. Now, when I vote tonight at, uh, at, uh, at 5 p.m., I will be thinking about one person in particular. And uh, he was a private person, so I've got absolutely no idea uh, about uh, his personal life. However, I know that he will be proud uh, that Scotland's journey on equality continues. Thank you very much. And I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Maurice Corrie. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today we take the next step in the process of righting a historic wrong with stage one of this bill. In this chamber on the 7th of November last year, this process started as the First Minister, on behalf of the Scottish Government, apologised to those who have been wronged and she rightly received her support from the leaders across this chamber of the political parties represented so herein. Ruth Davison, during that debate, said the jigsaw of equal rights is not yet complete, and today we see a significant piece added. And when we vote this evening, we will be adding that historic piece to the jigsaw. Of course, uh, what we now need to discuss and consider is how we take this bill forward to ensure that it will work in practice and ensure that every man who wants to is able to get a disregard. As has been noted by the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, whom I'd like to thank for all their hard work on this bill so far, in their stage one report, they wrote that the design and delivery of the application system will be key to encouraging men with historic convictions to apply for a disregard. The government is going to need to make sure that all necessary steps are taken so that the system and any paperwork which goes along with that system are intuitive and as easy as possible to understand. To make sure that, doesn't ha that does happen, that does happen, as the Equality and Human Rights Committee's report makes very clear, the government will need to make sure that they work closely with key stakeholders on the design and rollout of the application system. During the summing up, I think it would be interesting to discover what work and thought the government has undertaken in this area so far as to date. The importance of making sure that no one is put off from applying to, for a disregard due to the system being too difficult to navigate is because these convictions have had a real-world effect. Their effect lingers on, so to speak. This is highlighted in the cases which has already been referred to witness A and B who spoke to the committee and are included in their report. They clearly showed that the negative effect of these offences have had on their lives. Witness A spoke of how he felt he'd been held back in advancing his career because it made him wary of applying for new jobs or promotions because he would need to explain his conviction. Witness B told of how he had affected his, it had affected his ability to do charitable work and help his community because it came up during his disclosure checks. And these are but two examples which I think would be easy for anyone to imagine. There are countless others who have been held back from career advancement, stopped from helping out in their communities or been denied opportunities in other ways and a disregard can help them all if they could access it. Of course, the other part isn't just about the legal side, it's also about the emotional side of this issue, and that needs to be considered. And so I certainly welcome the committee's recommendation that the Scottish Government consider the families of deceased men, 
whom they, whom they may wish to have their loved ones' names to be cleared. And at this point, I'd like to refer to Alex Hamilton's very moving comment uh, about uh, Alan Turing. And I, too, am reminded of his brave endeavors and incredible work uh, which he did and was so unjustly treated uh, during the Second World War, yet he did so much to bring the success to our nation in World War II and bring peace to our country as we know it today. The Scottish Government should consider how we could, it could build a mechanism in the system uh, that is being delivered by this bill, which would allow a deceased man to be cleared. Some witnesses to the committee suggested the creation of either a certificate or a letter of acknowledgement. This option would have the ability to offer some comfort and disclosure, and, sorry, and closure uh, of, for the loved ones of a deceased man with these types of convictions. It is right that we are taking the opportunity to do, do this now because the attitudes in Scotland have changed. The Scottish uh, Social Attitudes Survey of 2015, which has been referred to several times this evening, uh, found that in just over 15 years, the number of people in Scottish society holding a positive view of same-sex relationship has risen to 69% by 2015, while those holding negative views are decreasing to 18% over the same period. And I expect this, train, this trend will, will well uh, continue. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would welcome, uh, I welcome this debate today and the proposed legislation. I look forward to being able to vote this evening in its favour. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll call Stuart Stevenson, and then we'll move to closing speeches and Daniel Johnson. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, and I'm delighted to be joining the unanimous uh, support that there is uh, in the chamber tonight for this piece of legislation. Um, I have come to this comparatively late, and of course my starting point, as it often is, is I have read the bill. And I want to just make one or two observations that uh, I hope will be seen as uh, seeking to improve it. I look at uh, Section 5, which is the application to have a conviction for historical sexual offence disregarded. I note that the government are going to consult on the application process, but I think in looking at what is on the face of the bill, we may be too prescriptive in what is in the bill, in the areas where we may need flexibility. And my particular example is at 5.2b, where an application uh, must include the applicant's name and address at the time of conviction. That isn't necessarily as easy as it sounds, as people particularly who, who have felt vulnerable may have moved address on a number of occasions and may not be able to provide the necessary accuracy in relation to the address at what may be a relatively distant event. Uh, so the former words in the next paragraph, insofar as is known to the applicant, could usefully precede uh, the issue of address. Now, it's a small matter, but you might even consider taking the requirements uh, at section two in five out into secondary legislation so that it can, if necessary, be modified uh, relatively straightforwardly in future. Uh, uh, looking at uh, section 7.1c, um, it uh, requires uh, Scottish ministers in particular uh, to obtain any record and any related to any subsequent proceeding relating to the conduct. Um, I, I just raise the question uh, that uh, that doesn't explicitly require ministers to go and look at newspaper information that might turn out to be the only uh, preserved uh, information that relates uh, to the issue. So I just ask ministers if we think about that. More substantially, uh, at 10.4, which is about uh, records, um, removal from records means recording with the details of the conviction that it is being disregarded. Now, the High Court records go to the National Records of Scotland after 10 years and the Sheriff Court records after 25 years. That's well within the life of the person whose uh, record may be marked as disregarded. That marking of the disregarding will, of course, be a public record available for people to see. I'm not sure that's absolutely right. I recognize uh, that there needs to be uh, the original record available somewhere, but I suggest that we think about redacting the personal information that goes to the NRS and not making it generally available until a substantial uh, period of time has passed. In the case of uh, registered births, 
that is, for example, 100 years. I speak as someone who does uh, genealogical uh, research. Uh, so I, I invite that to, to be thought of. And at 10.5, uh, I invite uh, the government where they designate by SSI relevant record keeper to make sure the national records of Scotland are among the relevant record keepers so the provisions can cover them. It might not be thought otherwise that they would. If they want to model uh, the way in which adoption records are protected and privacy are protected, you might care to consider. It is available under specified circumstances. I had to look for an adoption in relation to a probate case uh, and was able to find the information, having given adequate uh, 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 reason uh, for, uh, for, for doing so. Now, uh, both Boris Corey and Alec Cole Hamilton have uh, referred to Alan Turing. Now, as both a mathematician and a software engineer, Alan Turing is, of course, somebody I admire absolutely enormously. Uh, he came from a family of Scottish merchants, computer scientists, mathematician, logic, logician, cryptanalyst, philosopher, and theoretical biologist. He covered almost the whole uh, period. And he was in charge of Hut 8 at Bletchley Park during the war for some period, um, when they were working in particular on the version of the Ultra uh, Code, which had, uh, for the German Navy, extra provisions that were not used by the, the, the army. And a hundred, 16 billion billion variants uh, in outcomes uh, were delivered by that. There are those who, in looking at uh, Alan Turing's contribution uh, to the war effort, and this is the upper end, but it could well be true, have suggested his work and the work of Hart 8 shortened the war by two years and may have saved as many as 14 million lives. Alan Turing was uh, recognized for that. He was given the OBE in 1946, and he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1951. But none of that, none of that protected him in 1954, uh, 1952 when he was convicted uh, of an offense to which we're making reference today and his security clearance uh, was withdrawn so that he could no longer contribute to the security uh, and safety of the country. He committed suicide in 1954 as a result of how he was treated. Today, we continue to celebrate his memory with the Turing test, which is an important part of the modern work on artificial intelligence. But be they ever so great, be they ever so humble, they were all caught by the injustices of the past. Um, we won't forget the records and the detail. And sometimes you see the past glinting through the, the mists. If you go down to Rose Street Lane, you will find on the wall on the corners, you will find engraved on the wall, no loitering. And we've been talking about loitering and its particular meaning. That's why it's on the wall. Most people who ever look up and see that will be absolutely puzzled by what that means. When we get to the point that people are equally puzzled by the past on this subject, we have succeeded. Presiding officer. Thank you. We turn now to closing speeches and I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Jamie Green. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, presiding officer. And I'd like to begin by associating myself with so much of what has been said today. This has been a, a very rewarding debate to take part in because of the clear consensus that there exists right the way across this chamber. But also, I'm keen to associate both myself and Scottish Labour with the intent and objectives behind this legislation to extend pardon and indeed... Um, uh, 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 the, so the, the uh, um, disregard of uh, these historic uh, offences. Um, and, and I'd also like to uh, thank the committee for their uh, diligent work and the extremely useful report that they've provided us all, which has been referred to uh, right the way throughout this debate. But it's clear that this is a, an overwhelming uh, moral case to do this, because this is discrimination, discrimination of the worst possible kind, because the discrimination that we're tackling today uh, that we're seeking to put right today is people being discriminated on the basis of their identity, their sexuality. And there's no more fundamental part of our, of our identity than our sexuality. You know, who we love and indeed, as Patrick Harvey said, who we have sex with is who we are. A fundamental part of who we are as human beings, both 
public uh, social human beings and private human beings. And the fact that that discrimination was uh, 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 prosecuted by the state and set out in our laws is a, an injustice that we have to put right. But it was also a, a historic and human injustice. And, and it's the everyday normal behaviors that were made illegal, that we're seeking to put right, that, that makes this so important. And indeed, as many people have stated in the debate today, it's easy to bank recent progress. We're at a point in time where it does feel like a long time ago uh, that these things were tolerated and actually normal, these, these injustices. But it wasn't all that long ago. And indeed, much of the debate has focused on the, 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 the history. And indeed, I think Christina McKelvey put it very well, uh, pointing out that not only is Scotland maybe uh, kind of not the shining beacon that we might hope that we will be in the future, but indeed we were a laggard in many ways, uh, implementing legislation hundreds of years after our continental peers. Um, and indeed, I think that the committee's report uh, did very well to bring to life that, that these aren't historic issues. These are current and ongoing issues that people have had to face. A number of uh, speakers have referred to the evidence given by the people whose careers have been hin hindered and held back. People whose jobs today are not what they might be if it wasn't for this legislation um, that had uh, so grossly in, uh, 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 discriminated against them. So the reason I'm setting that out is because I think that context that's been discussed has been very important. You know, because we, that context is, is critical to the, the debate we have because we can't view it as history, as a job done. This is work that is ongoing and global in nature. And again, I think Patrick Harvey and Margaret Mitchell set out that global case, that, that global imperative to keep going and keep pushing forward as being vital. But it's also a context that we cannot ignore and delete. I think Alex Cole Hamilton put it very well in his intervention. We simply do not want to delete this history. We don't want to expunge it from our record. This is something that we must remain mindful of and aware of. But also the context of what has been done elsewhere. And I think Mary Fee set out the comparison with the UK legislation very well. And while that legislation is right in intent and we can support its intent, the fact that as little as 2% of people who may be eligible for, the, for those uh, uh, pardons have applied, I think it is a cause for consideration. The fact that its scope is more limited, and, uh, 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 and again, I think that our, the legislation we're bringing forward reflects that. But I'd also just like to reflect something that Cabinet Secretary said in his remarks. He's put it like this, that people continue to suffer as a result of the laws passed by previous parliamentarians. And I think that's important, because I think we should use this debate to reflect not just within the specifics of this debate, but the things that we are discussing today are obviously wrong to us today. And I think we should continue to think about what laws we pass and the things that we say and how they may be viewed by future generations. Because what is obviously wrong today might not have been viewed as such in the past. And I think we must view how our actions may be viewed in the future. So I, I particularly like those comments. And I think it's something that we should be mindful and reflectful of going forward. Now, just to come to the technical, some of the technical points, I think that the, this legislation is, uh, I think, very well conceived. I think its definition, um, being mindful of some of Stuart Stevenson's comments, I think, broadly speaking, it, it, the definitions it's used are flexible and useful. I think the fact that it has uh, defined sexual activity as broadly as it has, that it has uh, captured impugning, that, that, that it, it means that those people who were simply criminalized because of chatting people up um, will be uh, both pardoned and be eligible for disregard, I think is important. But I'd also just like to mention some of the discussion around the pardon. I thought Gail Ross's contribution was useful. Useful because I think she's absolutely right to highlight that we need to be careful about how we uh, consider pardon. But also, she also linked that to the consequences that these things have had, the inadvertent consequences and, and the consequences that people might not have foreseen. And I think that's important from this perspective in that this is a two-stage uh, 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 measure. There is the pardon and the disregard. And I intervened a couple of times to highlight the, the, the importance of awareness. And I think what is important is that people are aware of the difference between the pardon and the disregard. It would be extremely unfortunate if people felt that, or, or, or thought that the pardon may be sufficient uh, uh, but, uh, and not realize that they have to apply for the disregard. Now, I was very pleased by the, the, the uh, explanation that the, the Cabinet Secretary gave in terms of the simplicity and the stress that there would be on that. But I think 
that, that, that I would hope that there would be as much uh, focus on um, the awareness and communication of this so that people understand the difference between pardon and disregard and the need to apply for the, the disregard. Um, and I'll, I'll just briefly conclude by I think a number of other considerations were, were raised. I think the need for ease, which Kezia Dugdale raised. I thought Maurice Corrie made a very good point around uh, the need for some sort of acknowledgement, whether it's a, a letter um, acknowledging uh, 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 disregard for, 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 uh, uh, for posthumous uh, cases. Um, uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, above all else, we need to be constantly reflective about this legislation, both how it operates in a narrow sense so that we ensure that we can keep it up to date and ensure that it does what we intend it to do, but also that wider sense of reflection, that we always reflect on what we do in this place, its implications and how it might be uh, conce or, or conceived or regarded both outside this place, but also indeed by future generations. I'm very happy to support this bill at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you, and I call on Jamie Green to be followed by Michael Matheson. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I will, I've got quite a lot to get through in my summing up. There's some excellent contributions today, uh, so please do give me a nod if I'm eating into the Cabinet Secretary's closing remarks. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank members from right across the chamber uh, this afternoon. I've heard some, some of the most heartfelt and eloquent speeches I've ever heard in my two years uh, in this Parliament, and I'm really privileged to be taking part in this debate today. Uh, both as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, but also as convener of the Parliament's uh, cross-party group on LGBTI issues. Uh, this is an issue which we've been discussing since its uh, formation. Uh, this bill was introduced uh, first last November, and we've collated a huge amount of evidence. We've taken uh, written submissions, uh, testimony. We've heard from various witnesses. And uh, indeed, uh, an excellent survey was conducted by the Equality Network, which had over 700 responses. I'd like to personally thank those who gave, the, gave us submissions uh, and spoke to us as a committee, the organisations who got involved, like Stonewall UK, the Equality Network, but also agencies such as Police Scotland and Disclosure Scotland, the Law Society of Scotland, uh, and within the Parliament, the clerks, uh, my fellow committee uh, members, the convener of the committee, and also Spice, uh, who worked so diligently on preparing uh, this uh, uh, for us today. Um, this bill comes off the tails of what is commonly known as Turing's Law in England and Wales. Now, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around that bill. Uh, did it, it was, was the legislation perfect in England and Wales? Probably not. Uh, do we have a chance in this parliament to get it right? Absolutely, we do. Uh, but could this bill maybe improve the situation in England and Wales uh, as well? Possibly, and, and I hope that is the case. Now, throughout this process, we've heard some real telling testimony. We've heard from individuals who shared their stories. Uh, now, too often, men were forced to remain in the closet for uh, fear of not just persecution, but in this case, prosecution. Uh, men were simply not free to pursue consensual relationships, uh, loving or otherwise, uh, with other men. Simple acts, as we know, such as holding hands or kissing or even chatting in public, resulted in bizarre convictions that remained on their records throughout their whole lives. Uh, it prevented many of them for, from applying for jobs, uh, and it really serves as a long-lasting stigma uh, on their records. Now, uh, Patrick Ivory uh, spoke about the Glasgow, uh, Glasgow Gay and Lesbian Centre. I recall as a 17-year-old getting on the train from Greenock and going to that. I think it was on Dixon Street, just off of the St. Enoch Centre. My goodness, I was petrified uh, when I walked in the doors there. But what a warm welcome I received. But let's not forget that in 1997, it would have been illegal for me to have a relationship with another man. Uh, so this is modern history. This isn't just the 1950s and the 60s. And yes, many atrocities were committed in that time, but it, I, it really reflects and, and resonates personally uh, uh, with me. I, I'd like to touch on the, the contribution that Morris Corey made to ex explain that what we're doing today is not just about the legal aspects of the historical uh, sexual offences bill. And whilst I appreciate the technical uh, and contribution from Stuart Stevenson, some excellent points were made, and I, I hope we do reflect on those at stage two, we also are really looking at the painful emotional impact that these convictions had. And many members are right. It's not just a localized problem. This is a global issue. Uh, there are still 72 countries in the world where gay relationships are a criminal offense. And a third of those countries, it will see you prosecuted, jailed, and indeed executed. Many of these countries are Commonwealth countries. Uh, so we do have a, uh, we should not shirk our responsibility in that respect to raise 
these issues. Uh, I would also like to pay attention to something that I uh, raised uh, uh, throughout the proceedings, and that's the issue of those in our armed forces. Now, this is clearly about uh, pardoning and uh, uh, disregarding offences, uh, but many people were dismissed from the armed forces simply for being gay, not for committing any offence whatsoever. Now, unfortunately, neither of these bills um, uh, in Scotland or in England Wales really address that issue. Now, there are ongoing conversations around it uh, with the, the forces and government agencies. Uh, I, I'm pleased that there's been lots of positive messages come out of that. But I really do hope that we right the wrongs of those who served our country and the armed forces. I would like to pay uh, a real personal tribute to many friends of mine who left the military in those circumstances. And there's nothing I can say or do today, uh, today to them to make up for the loss that they had for losing their proud careers when it was taken away from them. Uh, so I really hope we address that. I'd like to touch on some of the other themes that came up throughout this uh, debate, because I think they're important to consider. On the issue of whether there should be a pardon uh, or not, uh, uh, Liam Kerr and I often uh, discuss the semantics of dictionary definitions, but um, there is a definition which says that a pardon is a cancellation of the legal consequence of an offence or a conviction, and that is the pardon in its sense as being a noun. I think that is acceptable to me and to many. Um, it's not necessarily about just forgiving. Uh, it's actually a technical uh, matter, so I think we do have to pardon in that respect. We know that the application process must be simple, but it must also be robust. Uh, and it should not put anyone off to go through this process. Uh, and I would like to hope that the uh, government will work with agencies like the Qualities Network when producing the process, the guidelines and the form itself. And I'm sure they will be, but I, I hope that they are a big part of that uh, process. Um, the government should also widely promote this disregard as best as, it, as possible. Uh, as Christina McElfie mentioned, the role that uh, the Disclosure Scotland has to play in this, and I think that's a very pertinent point. Uh, I think there are many agencies and third-party bodies who have a role to play in this. Uh, we did discuss compensation at the beginning. Perhaps I was minded to look at the model uh, in Germany where they do offer compensation. But uh, the feedback we got generally, I think, was that this wasn't about money. This was about achieving justice for those who had been treated badly. And I, and I have a huge amount of respect to that view. Uh, the automatic disregard definitely seems like a technical impossibility. And there are many reasons for that. They've been uh, well uh, presented to us today. But I did pose the question to one witness as to whether there could be an automatic disregard for certain types of offences which are not ambiguous and which are clearly related to sexual offences. Um, I think the book should still be open. Uh, if there is a will, there may be a way. Uh, and I wonder if that's something we could look at further. We also discussed something which I don't think has come up, and that's a disregard for those who are now deceased. Um, there were some members who felt very strongly uh, that the families of those uh, uh, who had loved ones who were prosecuted should have that option to also apply for a disregard. Now, what benefit it may bring them it's hard to pinpoint how that may happen. It's hard to pinpoint. But there were, there were views expressed that that could be an option. Uh, and the final issue around certification, uh, which again also comes from a, a, a German concept. Um, now, I've got no doubt that if somebody successfully applies for disregard and they get that disregard, they will receive some sort of documentation or paperwork. But how symbolic or official looking and feeling that is worded, I think, is, is still up for discussion. So I hope that is something that the, the bill team will, will take on board. Uh, I guess my final hope is that this bill really uh, sets an example that Scotland uh, is a gay-friendly and tolerant country. Uh, but I don't think the work is over. This bill should not be the end of the journey, but instead should be the springboard uh, uh, for future progress on how we as a nation uh, treat our LGBTI community. A true gay-friendly nation is one not, that is just free of legal discrimination, but also free from bullying, harassment, and social discrimination. Now, we might not be in the area of police raids and bars in our cities, but the reality is that today, still, many gay people are bullied simply of because who they are. I know this because I have often been on the receiving end of that, even since taking office. So let's welcome this bill. Let's congratulate those who helped shape it. But let us ensure this is not the end of the journey. We can disregard, we can pardon, but we should also make progress. Thank you. Thank you, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Matheson, to conclude the debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I begin by uh, saying thank you to all those members who participated in the uh, debate here this afternoon? Uh, 
There are, um, as it's been said in this chamber before, there are very often issues that can divide us, uh, but it's always encouraging when we bring forward a piece of legislation that has such strong uh, and clear uh, cross-party uh, support. I want to um, acknowledge in particular the uh, two witnesses who gave evidence to the, uh, to the committee in considering uh, this particular piece of legislation in the very sensitive manner in which the committee uh, made provision in order to hear their evidence in uh, private. Uh, because for uh, many, some people may feel at times as though this is, a, uh, this is a, a, an academic exercise, but the reality is that this is actually a piece of legislation uh, that it may touch the lives of uh, uh, a limited number of individuals, uh, but we should not underestimate the significance um, of the difference that it can make uh, to these individuals and the way in which they uh, conduct their lives, particularly where they have been uh, convicted of uh, an offence uh, in the past under discriminatory uh, legislation. I also uh, believe it's extremely important, and a number of members have made reference to this, is that this legislation is not about rewriting our uh, history. It would be a very serious error, I think, for anyone to try and take a course which is about uh, uh, revising our history and trying to uh, delete our history in the way in which uh, Alex Cole Hamilton made reference to in his uh, own comments. Uh, and also, as Annie Wells said, it, it's, uh, there is a potential uh, danger in trying to rewrite our history and the very fact that we had discriminatory laws uh, that were pursued by the state during a course of time is part of our history and who we are today. Uh, and we should always be prepared to learn from those errors of the past. Uh, and this piece of legislation is not about uh, deleting uh, records as such. It is about correcting uh, the way in which the impact on an individual's life uh, by having a conviction attached to their uh, record. Can I say that I um, have been struck by the uh, issues which have been raised by members in that uh, very often when it comes to stage one in a debate and a, you receive a, a committee report, there will be a host of recommendations which you can very often see are likely to lead to potential amendments, although I will be uh, holding uh, Alex Cole Hamilton to his commitment to non-meddling amendments in the bill at stage two and stage three. However, having said that, this is a bill which I do believe is in good shape in terms of the provisions which have been set out uh, within it, uh, particularly because we took um, a, a period of time to look at some of the, in our view, errors of the legislation in England and Wales in order to get the bill here in Scotland correct. Uh, for the very reason uh, that was highlighted by Kezia Dugdale in her, uh, her intervention to me in my opening remarks about the definition of sexual offences. Uh, the holding of hands, the kissing in public, uh, which this definition in our legislation will allow uh, to be considered as part of both the pardon and the disregard uh, provisions, which are not provided for in England and uh, Wales. And I believe that we have sought to try and get that balance right, and the broad definition which we've created helps to fulfil, I believe, a greater flexibility in dealing with a wider range of Issues. I'll give way to the member. Daniel Johnson. Just on that point, and given that there's been such uh, concern about uh, making sure that the process works so well, I understand that that will be uh, uh, governed by regulation and those will be subject to negative procedure. I was wondering if the Cabinet Secretary would con give consideration to having those uh, considered under the affirmative procedure so that it can have that scrutiny and clarity. Cabinet Secretary. So um, it, it, the committee made, raised that as a recommendation within their report and we've already written to the committee confirming that we are content to move that to an affirmative uh, procedure. Uh, which brings me on to, as I say, uh, I feel the report is not about technical aspects of the bill, but there are concerns around process elements. Concerns not on the basis of um, what we're trying to do, on the basis of trying to make sure we get it right. Uh, and as I said in my evidence to the committee, I'm absolutely committed to trying to do that and making sure that the gatekeeping mechanism, the application process, as some members have made reference to, should be as user-friendly as possible, um, it should be as intuitive as possible, uh, and that it is as simplified as possible. And I want to just pick up on a point that was raised by, I think it was Margaret Mitchell, in reference to uh, representations made in the letter and the response from uh, the Law Society about the provision for legal aid for the application process. Uh, 
to be perfectly honest, um, I would prefer there not to be legal aid required for the application process, because if the application process is as open and simple as possible, there will be no need to engage a lawyer for the purpose of making an application uh, for a disregard. And that's the approach I want to take. The last thing I want to do is that when someone wants to make an application for this is to, not for any personal reasons, uh, is to drive them into the hands of a lawyer and thinking I have to go to a lawyer in order to make the application. So I'm keen to make sure that we make it as open uh, and user-friendly as possible. And part of the process that we will undertake in developing the application process is engaging in a collaborative, cooperative fashion in the way in which we have in shaping up this bill to make sure that we are listening to the views and consulting with others who can help us in shaping that process in order to get it right and as user-friendly as possible. And I'll give way to Alex Cole Hamilton. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way on that point. I appreciate and absolutely accept the Government's intent to make the application process as simple as possible. However, there will be circumstances in which a disregard is not awarded, in which case that person may need a right to appeal. Will the Government consider legal aid in that circumstance? Cabinet Secretary. So, as we set out in our response to the Committee, we are looking at the existing legal aid at provisions in order to make legal aid by way of advice and assistance available to individuals in those uh, particular circumstances where they choose to appeal a decision not to award the disregard uh, to the Sheriff Court. Can I pick up on the issue of, um, so I hope that reassures members in our commitment to try and make sure we get this application process as open, as transparent and as easy as possible for people applying for it. And alongside that, having a public information campaign that is uh, that informs people about the process uh, that they can apply through in order to uh, make an application for a regard. And I'm more than happy to keep the committee up to date on the progress we're making on these matters as we take them forward. On the issue of the posthumous uh, disregards, and the members will be aware there are, there are practical challenges around providing a posthumous disregard. Not because I'm minded to be uh, opposed to such a proposal, if it was something that could be achieved in a fairly straightforward manner, I would have no uh, problem whatsoever in including it within the legislation. But it is worth keeping in mind at the point when someone dies, if they uh, have uh, details on the police criminal record system, is that they are removed, uh, they are deleted from the system, and that would be one of the key points that which we use for the purpose of gathering information uh, when we receive an application. The other factor that's important to keep in mind here is that it is necessary to have an understanding around when the conviction took place and also potentially which court it took place in as well. Because if we don't have that information, there are quite literally hundreds of thousands of court records that would have to be trawled through in order to try and find information, which would just be completely impractical uh, to be uh, achieved if we don't have that information. And the third thing which is more sensitive, it's important that we keep it in mind as well, is that it may be that the information which the family have is not entirely reflective of the conviction that took place at that time. And it could be that once an application is received and that the family then receive information which may say that the disregard has been refused and why it's been refused, that that in itself causes them some, some upset and concern as a result. So there's an issue of sensitivity that we have to also recognise in this. However, if there is a means by which we can in some way on the basis of the information which a family have and which is available to us, that had they, uh, that they would be, uh, it's likely they'd be entitled to a pardon and that they may have been entitled to a disregard based on that, I'm more than happy and open to considering how we can achieve that. But I do think we have to recognise there are some risks and real challenges around the posthumous disregard uh, system. So, and officer, can I uh, enjoy my uh, remarks to uh, a close? Um, recognise uh, that this is a piece of legislation which, as a number of members have stated, is a landmark piece of legislation. Landmark in making sure that we rectify the mistakes, the discriminatory mistakes that took place in the past in discriminating against individuals uh, because of their sexuality and the relationships that they had. This is a piece of legislation that allows us, this generation, to put that right. And I hope in this chamber here tonight, we'll be united in sending out a very clear view that Scotland wants to be a world leader, not just in LGBTI rights, but it also wants to put its own record right by removing 
these provisions from our own legislation and writing it for those individuals who were affected by discriminatory law in the past. Thank you very much. And that concludes our stage one debate on the historic sexual offences, pardons and disregards Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of two business motions, motion 11683 setting out a business programme and motion 11684 on a stage one timetable. Can I ask anyone who objects to uh, press their button now? I call on Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. And no one objects, therefore the question is that motions 11683 and 11684 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two motions. I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 11685 on deadlines for questions for bank holidays and motion 11686 on committee membership. Moved. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. And the first question is that motion 11659, in the name of Michael Matheson, on the historic sexual offences, pardons and disregards Scotland Bill, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 11685, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Bureau, on deadlines for questions for bank holidays, be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. And the next question is that double one, motion 11686, on, um, on committee membership, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, and that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business, the name of Kenneth Gibson, on artificial intelligence, future prosperity, a threat to employment or existential threat. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. <laughs>